welcome everyone. My name is Damaris Pereda and I am the National Programs Director for Period. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here in partnership and collaboration with the Intersex Justice Project. We are honored to be partnering with this organization to really talk about a subject that um, we don't want to put a blind eye to. Um, we are today we're going to be talking about intersex people and, and periods and what that means and, and what it doesn't mean and just everything in between. And so we're really excited to just hear from different people's experiences. So I'm going to just go ahead and pass it on to our moderator for today, which is uh, Sean from uh, and Saifa from our um, the Intersex Justice Project. Saifa, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Dama. Um, thank you to everyone uh, who showed up. Um, you could be doing other things, you can be other places, but you're choosing to spend your time with us and I appreciate that. So before um, I introduce the very amazing panelists, um, I just wanna take a moment of silence. Um, I'm wearing an ATL shirt, a black ATL shirt. I just moved from Atlanta, Georgia um, to England um, for a research fellowship and I wanted to take a moment of silence to remember um, the Asian women and the two other women of the six Asian women and two other women of color who were murdered um, as a result of racial terrorism. May the communities that we we love, honor, and respect, um, live with peace and dignity. Um, and when I say that, I mean people of color, um, people who are migrants, people who are queer, people um, who are part of your communities, um, who are laboring under white supremacy, may they live with peace. Um, so um, we're gonna go around um, and ask the panelists um, if you can share your name your pronouns, and where are you, who are your people, who are you repping, where are you um, calling in from? My name is Nick Manchester. My pronouns are he, him, or they, them. I am currently living in Colorado uh, in the United States, and I am repping the indigenous peoples of this country. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Crystal Hendricks. Um, I'm an intersex woman. I am all the way from Cape Town, South Africa, and it's good to be here today. Madi, talk to me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Madi. I use they, them pronouns, and I am from Sacramento, California. Hi, my name is Jessania Leon. I'm right now based in Berlin, but I'm from Colombia, so I'm definitely repping all the Black people from Colombia, especially the Black Indigenous ones. And I want to shout out my friends from Bremen, Germany, who are here. Ha! They are here, and I love them. <laughs> Yes, yes, give love to the folks. Um, so I just wanna do some general education before we start the panel, um, just to make sure everyone has the shared information. So when we talk about intersex, we're talking about uh, sex characteristics that include gonads, hormones, chromosomes, and genitals that are considered by the medical establishment atypical for males and females, bastards. Um, so up to 2% of the population is intersex, right? But those account for um, people who are identifiable as intersex because we don't really know who's intersex. Unless you can get a genetic test, I'm not sure if anyone on this call is not intersex. Um, there are over 35 documented intersex traits. So that just lets you know that anyone on this call could be intersex. And these intersex traits can manifest in childhood, in adolescence, or in adulthood. So again, we just don't know who's intersex. But I want to put forward that the people on this panel are dynamic and are great. Um, and they have a lot of great experience to share, they're dynamic activists. So to open up the conversation, I want to ask um, to the panel, what is your experience around bleeding? My experience with bleeding is one of extreme discomfort, um, a whole lot of dysphoria. Um, I often just call it my body betrayal. Um, it's 
it's really embarrassing for me. Um, and, you know, especially as being a guy, it creates a lot of social discomfort because there's no services for me to be able to go to. So either I go to the wrong bathroom or I worry about what do I do with my period products after I exit a stall. And so it just creates this nervousness of going out in public at all during that week, even though I really have to. I have a very interesting experience um, <clears throat> around bleeding in general. Um, it's definitely not something that I like to talk about. And that's something that, you know, I think that we're going to discuss a little bit further into the panel and into the questions. <clears throat> um, but I do, wow, sorry. <clears throat> I do have experience with it. Um, as somebody who um, can, as like an intersex person who can have a period, um, it's it's not something that happens very often for me. It's it's so like once every you know few years or something like that. Like it's very much not a consistent part of my life, and so it's not something that I tend to um, you know think about or even talk about. But I think it's something that's so important to like bring up to other people. It's so important to um, you know have this conversation about like okay. Um, you know, bleeding doesn't look the same for all people. And especially like when we're bringing intersex people into this conversation, we need to have this like, uh, you know, this setup of like, okay, um, maybe you are a person who bleeds. And, you know, for me, I am. Um, but I also, uh, you know, again, have that distance from it in a way that, you know, uh, some folks who maybe aren't intersex don't have. Um, and yeah, definitely something that I'm going to continue to chat about, like as we move through this panel. Mm. Actually, I can like relate a lot to that because for me, it was always connected to something first that I should have, like that should happen to me, but that somehow needed also to be induced, like, I don't know, with hormones or whatever the fuck was given to me being, I know I try not to swear. I try you know, not. yo, talk your <laughs> shit. Um, it, was like, <laughs> it was something that should happen but was connected to a lot of hustle and struggle because it didn't happen and there wasn't a proper answer for it and there was like that made me to something different by back then especially uh with doctors and like I was trying to I, w I should fit something that I that my my body wasn't even able and maybe my body didn't want to and needed to so I think that was always connected to a lot of stress and expectations um, that weren't mine but they were put mm -hmm. upon me and I think mm -hmm. that's my connection to bleeding and that was something that also was suggested to be uh, on a regular basis and so I think my connection is also yeah something around disrupted like disrupted to it i think it's 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 a very weird connection and i actually when i did it or when it happens it's connected to a lot of pain also mm. so yeah everyone um i would say if i think of my experience um of bleeding as an intersex woman that that doesn't bleed um i think my experience with bleeding is more just feeling ashamed of, you know, what society says of um, what a woman should be and how you as a woman should develop. Um, I feel I just have this, this, this relationship with, 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 with bleeding where it felt like I'm less of a woman because I do not bleed. And then because of this, this the standards of society forced me in so much shame with hiding with who I am and you know hiding that I do not bleed for wanting to fit in and wanting to be normal like everyone else so I think that the it's 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 a love and, and a hate relationship um that I have as an intersex woman with bleeding yeah thank you Crystal I think what you bring up is so important right like there's this like this societal expectation for people who are assigned female to bleed um, and that if you don't, then it's just like, well, what's happening, right? It's just like, what's going on? Um, so thank you all for sort of like that opening question. You all came with a lot of, like a lot of good um, thoughts and a lot of just of your personal experience. So thank you. Um, let's keep the ball rolling. Second question. Um, so how do you talk about your period? 
um, what words do you use? I'm totally fine starting off on this one. Um, yes, Mari. <laughs> yeah, take an initiative. Um, I I don't I don't talk about my period. This is actually the first time that I feel like I've ever publicly. Um, you know, talked about this or even considered the idea of talking about it. Um, as someone who identifies as non-binary in addition to being intersex, talking about it uh, has always, again, like brought up that sort of like discomfort, that sort of dysphoria. So um, like, I'm very, um, I guess, new to the idea of like, oh, what language am I actually comfortable with? Um, and it wasn't until, uh, you know, chatting about this panel that I was like, oh, I actually think that I like the idea of saying like, oh, bleeding, versus, you know, like menstruation or, you know, any other language that you could use, because I think that there's less, um, there's less pressure around saying like, oh, I'm a person who bleeds because, you know, that's something that like, again, for me is so like inconsistent that I don't feel like, um, it like other terms. Uh, I feel like other terms sort of imply that there's this thing that happens very regularly, or it's a thing that happens, you know, um, in a consistent way. So just saying like, oh, I'm a person who bleeds, I think is a is a is a much more comfortable thing for me. Um, and yeah, I'm actually thankful to finally be getting that language to to be able to talk about this. Actually, I also like can follow up with that because um, for me, I think it's always connected to something that does not happen regularly. So why should I call it period or a menstruation that's connected to the word month? Um, so and I think for me, it was like when it, when we discussed about how we want which kind of words we want to use for me it was very clear that that i would not call it period or a menstruation because yeah because that does not have that does not relate appropriately to my body that does not include me also it's something that happens sometimes sometimes and i mean sometimes related to also years <laughs> that it doesn't happen so um and it took at some realizing that it took at some point the pressure of having to um, to to think about in cycles because that's something that it's suggested all the time when you're assigned female at birth that it's a cycle and that if it's not happening and this during this amount of time is weird. So for me, I started at some point to to call it also bleeding. And also, actually, I started when I started talking about it. It was more like, for me, I wrote stuff down around, in, like in my first language, which is Spanish, and I and I of course call it sangrear because it makes more sense to me. It it made like it made a lot of sense, and it was more appropriate that something that should psychologically I don't know why happen on every month or whatever like for me it didn't bleeding was the only and I don't talk so much about my bleedings and I think that's also uh, it's connected to the thing um, that intersex people are not counted in in this conversation and um, that when we talk about periods and stuff it's always we have a very concrete image of who is bleeding and who's not and I think that was also a long time for me just not to even talk with anyone about it wow thank you Yesenia Nick I have kind of two experiences with periods um I'm trans I'm also intersex um and so when I first started my period as a teen it came after I had been forced onto hormones because my body was masculinizing too much. And like, there was this big, oh yeah, you started your period. And I was just like, what the hell is happening with my body? Um, and um, just like a lot of confusion about what was going on because they couldn't really give me answers about my body besides, you know, oh yeah, you're bleeding now because we gave you all these shots that made you incredibly sick. Um, so then, I refer now to my bleeding as a body betrayal because it just feels like I was betrayed into having a period because they forced one on me by screwing with my hormones. 
And so for me, it's kind of like this thing of like, I'm very open about my period because I'm angry that I have one. <laughs> um, and I don't mind educating people on the fact of, oh, hey, yeah, they don't make products for me. So I have to use Depends. You know, like if somebody asks me for period products, they get, you know, the, the pens and a big bag, big, big bag of wipes because what else are you going to do? You know, so it's just, it's a, I don't know, it, it's kind of like I have that dual experience with it where it was it was expected when I was a female and now it's people are angry about it when I'm a male and yet I'm going down the middle like hey I'm an intersex chimera deal with it yeah Nick I think that's such a good what you bring up is so deep right just around the medical experimentation that happens to intersex folks right and that we are subject to interventions that we don't want, right? And it's just like, literally like, that's what we are all sort of advocating against. <laughs> it's like, these interventions need to stop so that people can decide what they wanna do with their own bodies. Um, you know, Krista, I wanna kind of circle back around to you um, because, you know, I grew up, um, I was assigned female at birth you know, when people were going, you know, having their periods, I would be like, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. I knew nothing about periods at all. I was just making shit up on the fly. Um, so I'm curious about your experience. Um, you know, how did you talk about it? Yeah, I think um, when I think about talking about period, like I think not not discovering I was intersex, but knowing that I never got my period. And um, the same as Nick said, when I went to go see a doctor, went to the hospital, they also put me on like tablets and they said, you know, when you hit the red one, your period is going to start. And so I was that entire month, I was just like, okay, I need to, I can't wait, I need to eat the red one because I'm gonna get my period and, and boom, I'm gonna feel so complete and so happy. And then I hit the red one and nothing happened like nothing at all happened. And I think in that moment, it, it blocked out everything about the period, about having a cycle, about menstruation. And I just, I think at that moment with, with my friends and my peers, I just start living a life like, hey, it's normal. And when people talk about their period, I join the conversation, like someone that has an experience about the period for not wanting to be outed, not feeling safe. And, and feeling that I, I might be harmed, might be bullied, might be erased. You know, the intersex community knows all about erasure because they try to erase us from the moment when we are born. And you know, like some, you want to combat that erasure. And I, for, for a long time in my life, like I just, I was a part of the conversation and act like I was someone that had a period and I knew nothing <laughs> about periods at all, but it's just to, just to feel safe and, and, and just to, 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 to feel that you belong. And I think it's, it's up to the point where you actually come out and discover so much about your body that you can be proud and we can have this conversation. Like you don't see intersex people talking about period because I think that was the one thing that society used to erase intersex women, women identifying as well. Like how can you say you are a woman? Like, do you have a period? Like, no, you don't. So therefore you are not a woman. And now I feel like intersex people are coming out and saying like bullshit. Like, you know, you don't decide who I am. I am who I am. and. It's just, let's go with the flow. Like, you know, don't worry about on flow. Let's go with the flow. <laughs> Yo, that is brilliant. That is brilliant. You know, and I think, you know, everybody needs to come out and be fabulous like you, Crystal. You know, just just come out and just be fabulous. Um, thank y'all everyone again for all of your very deep, thoughtful um, responses. Um, so in this process of, you know, bleeding and just, just your, your journey, right? Your gender journey, your body journey, like what have you learned about your body? I think, um, I think I, um, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult question for me to ask because I feel like me learning about my body kind of was controlled 
um, by the, the medical um, fraternity, by hospitals, you know, um, deciding or informing my, my parents that it's best for me to have surgery and have my testes removed. And what I learned about my body is that now I need to control my body with hormones. When my body was perfectly normal, creating hormones that, you know, I need to survive. But then because of surgery um that was um, done now I had to go on hormones and you know I, I felt like I could never really experience who, who this body is who, who my what my body is about because my body has been so pathologized and I feel like a medical experiment and for my life I need to be on hormones up until the day I die where I should have not, because if I did not have surgery that was unnecessary, um, that was normalizing me to fit into binary notions of male and female, um, I feel I would have discovered so much about my body as an intersex person. You know, I know at this time, you know, you take so much control, you are out, you are so proud, but there's still that, that big part of you that was taken away about actually discovering your body as an intersex person, with your body being whole as an intersex person what 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 doctors think that they are making your body whole but they are actually breaking it because they are fixing it to their terms which is it's not always right and that's my experience wow I can relate to so much of that um the and and wow just like the way that you said all of that was amazing um I particularly relate to the idea of being like a medical experiment for doctors um, I remember when I was like 18, I went to the doctor and I was sort of like, okay, like I've never, I've never had my period. Like, you know, I'm 18. Like, is that something that maybe should have happened? Like, I think I brought it up in like passing, like it wasn't even sort of like on my radar, but it was something that I did say. Um, and at that point, doctors were like, oh, like that's, you know, not, you know, normal. Like we need to do something about that. And for them, that included a lot of like hormones and other medications, and they wanted me to do this and that. And I remember just being like, I'm comfortable in my body. Like I'm, I'm fine not having a period. Like that's fine with me. So the fact that they were trying so hard to get me to fit into this idea of like, oh, what is someone who's assigned female or like, what does that look like? Um, was, yeah, it was, it was so, um, uncomfortable for me and it actually led me to just not going to the doctor like straight up for years because I was like well you're just trying to force me to do something with my body that I don't want to do um so yeah like getting to make the decisions about my body about okay no I don't want to go on hormones or maybe I do and maybe um you know I I'm comfortable again not having a period like that's something that I'm fine with um has been really like a complete journey of its own like figuring out what I'm okay with and what, you know, um, versus the idea of what I should be. Um, so, yeah. Nick, I know you've been, it's been like double Dutch. You've just been waiting to jump in. So, you know, jump in, Nick. Okay. Um, I think for me, what I've learned about my body is how to tell when a cycle is coming on, because being a chimera, I flow from you know, more of the estrogen to more of the testosterone. And so I can tell when one's coming up, but the estrogen makes me feel sick and that sort of thing. But I think that's like, I think some of the severity of my flow, ebb and flow is caused by the hormones that they forced me to take as a teenager. Um, you know, and I'm also coming towards, you know, whatever menopause will look like me you know, look like for me. And um, so, but then I have this deep seated fear of going to the doctor because of the very things they're talking about medicalizing. Um, you know, I, I went to a doctor one time for, you know, just to see if I could even get an ablation. And instead I was offered sterilization and castration. And I was just like, no, you know, and so there's a lot of fear of going to the doctor, a lot of fear of being medicalized further and feeling like I'm in my forties and I still really don't know what's going on with my body because there's nobody I can ask. Yeah, I can relate to that a lot, actually. Um, I always say 
and my mom always hi mom it always cracks about because i say i could hold a degree in medicine specifically and i could be an ob i could i also hold a phd in pharmacology because i have to know these things i'm a fat person first i'm a black person i'm a fat person so this connection is my body has always been pathologized since day one i came out of the womb and i was just like pathologized so for me as a fat person everything in my life goes deep to the conversation you're fat i could i could really have broken, I don't know, my leg, and it's just because I walk wrong because I'm fat. So my, 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 I had to really the whole time fight literally to everyone and everywhere I go because I'm a fat person. So I discovered very late that I'm an intersex person because of my hormones, because my body was put upon, um, hormone treatments to ensure I could give birth because that's what basically women do. And I was assigned it the whole time. It has been ignored Then I do not identify as a woman, but that, that was never the case. That was like always out of the conversation just because I look somehow. And that's something that really I have to say, there is no way to look intersex. We all look different. There is that, that gender expression and how we look, that's some, that two different business. So, and also like being the whole time um, pathologized as someone who should be giving babies to this world and should be having uh, enough amount of female hormones um, that, ha that have been putting me through a lot of medicine, through a lot of, a lot of actually also operations and surgeries because my body wasn't good female enough um i'm talking about an experience of 15 years so i had to advocate for my body at some point um because i always i never had this sense of like what's going on with my body i know all through all the birth controls to all the hormones to all the gestations to everything that i was put upon um i had to say at some point stop and to figure out where to go because i have talked to many doctors in my life i've been in many surgeries i have been talking from health practitioners from oncology to everyone who could at least explain what's going on with me and no one could tell me you're just intersex no one it took me move to another city to find someone who actually is a trans doctor in the city where I live, that it's, a, that's a trans person and it's a doctor to tell me, you know what, this is going on with you. This is, this is some, and I'm almost 33. So it's, it's like something that it took me a long time to figure out and until then i just had to fight every time just because there always was the always the conversation was always around you have pcos which is very common and that connected to fatness it's just like you're just fat so therefore um and it's your pcos and therefore your body cannot um, produce an, 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 an enough amount of hormones um, for females. And that's why we're going to give you metformin. We're going to put you on birth control. We're going to put you on everything. And till the point that it wasn't, I'm not talking about mood swings. I'm talking about, I don't know what to do. I'm in pain. So I know there's a lot of practitioners looking in here. And I think that's something you should very, very listen to. Like stop pathologizing pop fat people stop for pathologizing especially fat bodies what ask yourself like what's the question besides you're a fat person like that's something that i actually do i go to a doctor and i say i'm sorry my back hurts something very common because i'm an educator i sit a lot and they say you're a fat person and i say yes could you tell me besides the fact of stuff that i already know um, could you please tell me what could be else? And I think that's also something that um, that really goes lost in conversation and intersects. 
conversations. Hormones are different. Hormone, we don't talk about a spectrum. We also do not talk about uh, the different variations of being intersex. And I, yeah, it took me a lot of years and uh, going to uh, human Jana, how do you call it? Like the person who looks at your chromosomes, how do you do that? How do you call that? I don't even know, but there Genetic was someone thing? who looked at my chromosomes and could tell me. So, you know, that, that shouldn't be, yeah, geneticist. Yeah, that's the person. So I think what you bring up is so, I think all of y'all are just nailing these questions. And I think what you all have brought up, which I kind of want to just kind of crystallize is that intersex people are pathologized, right? Like we use the term intersex. You can use intersex, intersex variations, variations in sex characteristics. But what do doctors use? Disorders of sexual development. Now they may say differences in sexual development, but it's still DSD, right? Um, and, you know, I think what you bring up around seeing a geneticist, if you have health insurance, because a lot of people don't have health insurance, unfortunately, if you're living in the U.S., um, is that a lot of people have been misdiagnosed, right? There are people with PCOS and it may have other intersex variations, right? I think sometimes doctors, whenever they see something that they're not sure of, they're like, oh, androgen sensitivity, hyperandrogenism. PCOS, right? And it's just like a catch-all, right? But so many people get lost in the process. Um, so I want to jump to um, this question um, for the panel, because um, I feel like we've touched on um, just like people's experiences with medical practitioners, right? Um, and one question I do want to bring up is that for the medical practitioners who are on this call right now, because it's going to be recorded, people might watch it later. Based on your experiences, what would you tell medical practitioners who are watching this right now? All right, I have a, I have a good one. Um, believe intersex people when we talk to you about our own bodies. Like, it, it's so having lived experience being in our bodies 24 seven growing up with our bodies like that is oftentimes it, it's so much more important and more relevant than like, a, you know, one day lecture that you might have taken about what it means to be intersex, you know, intersex people, we know what's best for our, our bodies most of the times and if medical professionals started to just accept, you know, the that we do know about our bodies and that our lived experience is important when we bring these things up it would be so much easier to have these conversations if I were to say no I don't want to go on hormones like no I'm not interested you know for a medical professional to be like okay then let's talk about you know potential alternatives or let's talk about you know what that might mean for your body if you don't do this but you know not just presenting one option and saying you have to do this or you know like something like I, I remember often being told by doctors like if you don't do this thing like you'll get cancer or you'll you know have some other horrible thing happen to you like no I like I'm deciding no that's not something that I want and your job now is to basically help me you know uh figure out care moving forward like without that option and and you get again alternatives so absolutely that is something that I would definitely say to any medical professional out there uh listen to your inner you know your intersex patient and believe them when they talk to you about, you know, our own bodies. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with Mari and like, I would just like say like, you know, intersex people, they, they know about their body, it's, it's their body. So at the end of the day, you know, intersex people just need that autonomy. They need that self-identification, you know, and I believe that I feel that, you know, oh, surgery should only be done if there is medical complication that can be proven that if we do not do this, this person will die or they would not be able to do this or that. But it shouldn't just be because you choose to want to normalize, you know, you're literally performing cosmetic procedures on babies because you want to normalize them. You want them to look the way you think is perfect, but you know, they are perfect. So I feel like 
unless there's really medical reasons as to why someone needs to undergo surgery because it might affect the, um, the health immediately, like then go, go ahead. But if there's no risk and there's nothing proven, like I think when I had my um, testes removed, the things that was told to my mother, if we don't remove this, Crystal could get cancer in a few years, they could become cancerous. If they were, and now doing research, that's never been proven. There's no data of intersex people that has their testes that have gotten cancer in their twenties or thirties. And I mean, I'm, I'm turning 35. So, I mean, I could have been living my best life with my testes, but instead I, I was, my, my parents were told like, hey, we need to remove this because your child is gonna have cancer. Also, they need to stop missing informing parents uh, about intersex um about the intersex children and also stop misinforming intersex people about their bodies um let intersex people um guide the conversation i promise you that intersex people know more about their bodies than what a doctor knows about their bodies like we are forced to research our body we are forced to to research what's happening within us so so we can be there for ourselves and also like doctors you know when you visit the doctor stop asking that question so when was your last period? Like, why? Stop it. <laughs> uh, Crystal, I often lie when I get asked that. And I'll be, <laughs> they'll be like, when was your last period? And I'll be like, oh, last week. It might have been three months ago, but it was last week, damn it. Now let's move on. <laughs> so what I would say is, um, and unfortunately, I, this is necessary to say because I know a lot of adults that has happened to when an intersex person comes to you for help as an adult and they are having hormonal issues and they can tell you that they are having hormonal issues they can tell you that there is something wrong with a part of their body that they want removed such as my uterus um do not under any circumstances offer sterilization or castration of any other body part do not there are so many of us that have had to experience that there are so many of us who have left offices and refused appointments that were made because we were afraid to go under the knife with that surgeon for fear that we would wake up with the wrong things missing so do not under any circumstance ever ever offer that um and i also completely agree with uh what crystal said about making sure that you're not lying to parents um, I was, you know, my parents were also told the whole lie of if I didn't have my reproductive organs removed, that I was going to have cancer. They couldn't afford any chemo. They couldn't afford the surgery. So thank God my body was left alone, except for that time that they forced me on hormones. But I lived my entire childhood from the time I could understand what cancer was until the age of 18, when I finally bullied it out of a doctor that no, they didn't really know for sure um, that I had cancer and was going to die. Um, do not ever do that. Like, yeah, you're evil if you do that. Find another ways. Find another ways to see bodies that do not fit in your idea of gender binary. Find fucking ways, teach yourself. Find books outside your white, you know, that when you look at books, they're all white, actually. When, when you, I, I mean, I have a lot of friends who are practitioners and they're doctors somehow. And have you looked at their books, what they talk, who are they talking about? That, do you know the history of OB-GYNs? They, on who they tried their science. So for me, it's like, I don't even remember when I was the last time to my ob -GYN because I actually have to find another one. So, and I have to make sure this person's, when I, this person, when I go there, I can be me. I'm, I'm not hiding anything from me anymore. And I don't want you to come to me with your very cisgender idea of how my body should look like. If you cannot deal with that, 
that's fine. That's none of my business. It's actually not fine, but it's none of my business. And not, it's not my business to teach you as my doctor about my body. So find ways to teach yourself on that because I'm tired. I'm really tired. Um, this experience uh, is something that you can find. I'm actually reading about intersex people during the time before, before, for the 1900s. So we have existed since ever then. That's nothing that you can tell me that has not been written before. So find your new books, find you new books, find you new convers people who can you talk about. Deconstruct your idea of how, how people and bodies look like and how their hormones are and how they should look like because this shit is tiring. Woo, y'all are really just humbling me. You know, these are um, some bad asses on this panel. Um, I'm gonna ask um, for y'all to drop your information, um, how people can get in touch with y'all on social media. Um, you know, these are two organizations, period, and IJP that are coming together for this. But as Caitlin said, come on, Caitlin, drop your Venmo in the chat, drop your PayPal, um, you know, get that Skrilla because y'all, what y'all have offered us um, is invaluable. Um, and I just want to personally thank y'all for responding to this call and just like really showing up. Um, so we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, and, you know, I, I would ask when people um, ask questions, you know, let's keep it cute. You know what I'm saying? Let's keep it cute. Um, I think people have shared very graciously and openly. So basically I'm gonna hit y'all with this. Um, what do you wish sex educators would say or teach about puberty menstruation for intersex folks? Um, that it's not a one size fits all sort of situation when it comes to sex education and just, you know, everything else like bodies, reproduction, all of that fun stuff. Like I used to advocate so hard when I was even in high school to be like, okay, there's not just these two. I mean, I see the two diagrams that we have, but that's not it. Um, so just having the understanding that, you know, like that isn't, I, I mean, I don't even think we should use just the two diagrams and say like, oh, and there are other things as well. What we should talk about is the fact that sex and reproduction and, you know, um, bodies and all of these things exist on the spectrum and they aren't always going to be at either extreme. They're sometimes a little different than that. And if so, it, you know, if that was something that was uh, like led with in so many of like sex education classes and things like that, I think that that would be uh, just all around better for intersex people, it would be better for trans folks, and it would be even better for, you know, cis and non-intersex people who have variations and differences as well. I think it also needs to extend to other classes. Um, like when I was in high school, we had to do that stupid pi square um, class for, for genetics that we were told to use our own genetics. Well, mine are 46XX, 46XY, I did that in that stupid Punnett square and I failed it because the teacher said those genetics didn't exist. So like just including us everywhere in education will will just help change and stop erasing intersex kids like literally everywhere in school. That's dope y'all. Um, so the next question, I'm kind of ping pong in it. Um, so I really like this one and I'm the moderator. So I get to uh, pick out my favorites. Everyone, no question is dumb. All questions are great. Love that for everybody. Um, but basically this question is, um, my one-year-old daughter is intersex. Um, what would be your best advice for me as a parent? Advocate strongly, get in touch with other intersex people and if a surgeon goes to suggest surgery or tries to force surgery, do your best to get help 
from adults in the intersex community, because believe me, we will fight for your child. Yeah, and I would say, I think um, being an adult now, I think just let the child be a child. Like, I think that is just the important thing. I think from, you know, from 12 on questioning your body, you forget to be a child and you forget to have that experience of, you know, having a carefree life. Um, because you are self pathologized from so young that you know your 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 mental health and everything starts becoming fragile. So I would just say, just let your child be a child, and just make sure that you educate yourself um, on intersex um, experiences. And also, trust me on this, kids. They know. They know. They know so much. Trust your kid before anyone else trust them trust them a lot they're gonna tell you what they need and what they want and what they definitely do not want teach yourself on that really it's gonna be it's gonna be good because your kid is already good so i want to get to this question i think it's important um this question is um how would you advise another intersex person um how would you advise them to approach medical professionals about hormonal treatments, surgeries, et cetera? I would love to be more confident and appreciate some advice. I can just say from my experience, right? So for me, it was a key to read a lot. That's actually just me. That's my thing. I have to say, I since I couldn't find answers that were fitting me, I'm ensured that I knew enough. And believe me, I know more than a lot of doctors um, about what it means to be intersex and black and fat. So when you go to a doctor, trust yourself that you will know again more than this person in front of you. And if this person somehow meets somehow your needs, relax, because then you know this person is listening and this person is taking care of you. Unless then, don't let your guard down. I'm sorry, I have to say it that way. It's annoying, it hurts a lot, it takes a lot of energy. Don't let your guard down. Trust yourself first. Your body, you feel it, you know it, even if you don't have the language for it. I did not have for a long time the language for it. Trust yourself first and trust your gut. You know, you're feeling it, it's yours. It's like, that's the best thing. And when you see a doctor and they're just trying to tell you bullshit because that's 99% of all the time what happens, just let them speak and go and find another one. Because it's like, it's like dating. I'm sorry, I have to say it that way. It's like dating. You have to find the perfect match. And sometimes it takes a lot of time. <laughs> I'm gonna echo everything you just said and add, take someone with you. Take someone with you. Do not be afraid to drag a friend or family member into that office with you. That doctor may try to intimidate you out of taking that person out of the office. And if they do, run like hell. And that's on how not intersex people can advocate for intersex people, just saying. So I think there's been like a lot of questions around, um, you know, language, a lot of questions around language, right? So like, what are some, um, what is some good language that feels intersex affirming um, as intersex people like interact with medical professionals, doctors, therapists, what feels like good language for y'all? For me, I always recommend that people try to stay away from terms that can be like super pathologizing and medicalizing about the intersex experience. So like condition or like disease, disorder, like these are all terms that to me at the very least are very othering. And again, they sort of place this idea that like intersex bodies are wrong in some way when obviously that's not the case. Um, and then I of course recommend that folks use terms like, you know, an intersex variation, like, you know, variation is such a good term to use when referring to, um, you know, any part of like an intersex person's body. So intersex variations, um, you know, intersex people, intersex bodies um, are definitely 
definitely all the terms that I recommend folks use, especially in, you know, the medical context. Yeah, I, I would also um, echo on, on my as well. Um, I think for myself also, um, when I was diagnosed, pathologized, I was told that I have complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. I still don't know what that really means and I really don't care um, until I found the word intersex and that was the word I became comfortable with. And also identifying as an intersex woman and you know, sometimes you get called out because people ask you um, a lot of questions like, so do I, because you identify as a woman, which are you identifying as a cis woman? I'm like, no, I can never be. I identify as an intersex woman. And that is that is what I am comfortable with. Um, I think when you move over to calling things a disorder, a disease, or it's really pathologizing and it can really be harmful towards intersex people. I think also when speaking with intersex people ask them what they are comfortable with as well. I mean, I do know intersex people that are comfortable using words like CAIS or AIS, and it all depends what they are comfortable with. But for me as an intersex person, I am comfortable with the, the variations and also just by using the intersex word. I wanna ask all the panelists one final question, um, which is, what would you tell your younger self? I want to go first because I love that. <laughs> um, be bold. I think I would love to tell the little Jazania kid who moved to another country, be bold. You've got this. That. I would say um, it's OK to be different. Um, it's okay to not fit into the molds that society has sort of like created and expects us to fit into. Um, it's okay to, uh, you know, not it's okay to advocate for yourself. It's okay to challenge um, the ideas of what it means to be, you know, either a person who bleeds or a person who's, you know, assigned female at birth or whatever. Um, that's okay. Like, uh, you know, I think that my younger self would have loved hearing that. And so I think the best advice I ever got, and it's something that I would like to tell my younger self, is own your freak. We all have a little bit of freak, and just own your freak. Uh, I think um, what I would, I would tell younger self is just, just be yourself. Like, you are badass. Like, just be yourself. You don't have to be anyone. Just be yourself. Love that. Love that. Love y'all. Um, thank y'all all so much. This was a beautiful conversation. Um, please follow these folks. Find them on social media. They are dynamic. They are changing the world. Um, thank y'all all for, thank you all to the panelists. Thank you everyone who showed up, showed out, asked questions, shared their truth in the chat. Um, yeah, follow these folks, follow IJP, follow the period movement, and thank you all. <laughs>